This is Naked Mormonism. I pledge my life, all that I may have. I will strive to the utmost of my ability to be what you would want me to be. It's time to find the truth. And having set our hand to the plow, we will never look back until this work is finished. Where is the church going? I have faith that the Constitution will be saved as prophesied by Joseph Smith. But it will not be saved in Washington. It will be saved by enlightened members of this church. The explicit tag is there for a reason. So if you get offended at what's said, it's not for you. But most importantly, may you ponder the truths you've heard. May they help you become even better than you were. Skepticize everything. Welcome to episode 92 of the Naked Mormonism podcast. This is the Serial Mormon History Podcast. Today is Thursday, March 1st, 2018. My name is Bryce Blankenagle, and thank you for joining me. On this episode, we cover the evolution of the first vision accounts spurred by an 1841 interview with Joseph's brother, Reverend William Smith. From the 1829 revelation included as Doctrine and Covenants section 20 today, to the mid-1830s, to the John Whitmer history in 1838, to the history of the church printed in the Times and Seasons in 1842, Joseph's story looks less like an actual occurrence and more like the coming-of-age story of a mythological figure. Was it God and Jesus who appeared? Was it the angel Nephi? Did the sacred grove even happen? These questions and more pose serious challenges to the claims of divine providence of the young prophet. After that, we have on Justin Clark from the Reason Revolution podcast to talk about the rise of the free thought movement in 19th and 20th century America. Let's get into it. Deluded fanatics. Religious imposters, ignorant knaves, wretches of the adversary. In spite of their endless efforts to be taken seriously, the religious society of the 1830s and 40s considered the Mormons to be a nuisance at best and fanaticism hell-bent on the subjugation of the American people at worst. The truth of the matter is, from the Florida Keys to the Great Lakes and west to the Mississippi, the popular press had been following the Mormons with some fascination and loads of skepticism since its inception and meteoric uprising in Ohio. The conflict in Missouri had only spurred the uprising of hundreds more publications showing the Mormons in less than favorable light. The joy historians have today with how new the Mormon religion is and how documentable its uprising is compared to other religions is a joy which journalists shared when the religion was truly in its infancy. The hundreds of indexable newspaper articles we have today had to be collected and printed by people who took fascination in the tides and forces of the public movements, like Mormonism. And it's thanks to those valiant journalists that we know so much of Mormonism from sources other than church chroniclers and propagandists. It's to be expected, though. This widespread public fascination with Mormonism They weren't just a Christian sect with their own interpretation or translation of the Bible. They were claiming to have new scripture, which comprised a third testament of Jesus to the Native American peoples. If it was to be believed by the wider populace that Joseph was a true prophet, he needed an incredibly miraculous story to sell his divine providence. We're going to spend the historical portion of today's episode walking through something a lot of Mormons have trouble with when they begin studying Mormon history. In episodes 32 and 33, way back in the Wayback Machine, we spent a bit of time talking about the various versions of the First Vision story, and we've touched on the topic a few times throughout the three and a half years that we've been doing this show, but let's take a step back and examine the context from which these First Vision accounts arose. This is particularly relevant to our timeline in 1841, and I'll try to illustrate why by the end of the history segment today. The earliest account we have of the first vision is found nestled in Oliver Cowdery's revelation, included in today's Doctrine and Covenants as section 20. This was likely recorded in the summer of 1829, or possibly right after the church was created in April of 1830, but it wasn't published until 1833 as chapter 24 of the Book of Commandments. 
In the Book of Commandments, chapter 24, it tells of Joseph's heavenly manifestation as such after naming him an elder of the church alongside Cowdung Oliver Cowdery. From verse 6, we read in Book of Commandments, chapter 24, quote, For after that, it truly was manifested unto this first elder that he had received a remission of his sins. He was entangled again in the vanities of the world. But after truly repenting, God ministered unto him by an holy angel whose countenance was as lightning, and whose garments were pure and white above all whiteness, and gave unto him commandments which inspired him from on high, and gave unto him power by the means which were before prepared that he should translate a book, which book contained a record of a fallen people, and also the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, and also to the Jews, proving unto them that the holy scriptures are true." End quote. And that's it. That's the entirety of the first vision account from uh, DNC tw- uh, 24. Uh, well, Book of Commandments 24, DNC 20 today. But let's point out the details here. There's no dating of this holy angel manifestation. There's no appearance of God in Jesus. There's no sacred grove. There's no reading of the Bible in James 1 5. There's no telling Joseph that all of the religions are led astray and their professors are corrupt. There's no appearance of the gold plates. It's just a book. And nothing all that remarkable which would set Joseph above any of his religious counterparts as contemporaries of the religious movements of the day. Possibly in 1832, Joseph penned his own account. And this is the only account of the first vision experience from Joseph Smith himself. Every other version before and after this 1832 version were dictated to a scribe or were recalled from hearing Joseph preach his history to prospective members. This supposed 1832 version had a fair amount added to it by Frederick G. Williams in his handwriting, but we'll only focus on what Joseph himself wrote in the visionary account. And the reason I keep saying, you know, possibly 1832 and claimed and supposed 1832 is because there's no actual dating on this account. And Mormon historians know that Frederick G. Williams became Joe's scribe in February or March of 1832, and they basically surmise that one of his first tasks was helping Joe to create this history that we're about to read. It may have been a bit later than 1832, but it's definitely not earlier than that. The Joseph Smith Papers has narrowed this account to July of 1832, at a time when hingepin Sidney Rigdon was in error and led astray. Now, that's how it's purported anyway. They don't discuss a possible causal link between Rigdon preaching against Joseph Smith's divinity at this time and the crucial timing of this history being penned. But I think that we can draw these corollaries maybe to the point of causation in this instance. So this supposed 1832 account reads in part, quote, This was a grief to my soul. Thus, from the age of 12 years to 15, I pondered many things in my heart concerning the situation of the world, of mankind, the contentions and division, the wickedness and abominations, and the darkness which pervaded the minds of mankind. My mind become exceedingly distressed, for I become convicted of my sins, and by searching the scriptures I found that mankind did not come unto the Lord, but that they had apostatized from the true and living faith. And there was no society or denomination that built upon the gospel of Jesus Christ as recorded in the New Testament. Therefore I cried unto the Lord for mercy, for there was none else to whom I could go and to obtain mercy. And the Lord heard my cry in the wilderness, and while in attitude of calling upon the Lord... Now, and in right here, uh, this is where Frederick G. Williams, or Freddie Willie as we know him, added in the 16th year of my age. It's just inserted there as in between the lines in Frederick G. Williams' handwriting. So that's just an important addition in there. So while in the attitude, uh, sorry, while in attitude of calling upon the Lord, a pillar of fire light above the brightness of the sun at noonday come down from above and rested upon me, and I was filled with the Spirit of God. And the Lord opened the heavens upon me, and I saw the Lord, and he spake unto me, saying, Joseph, thy sins are forgiven thee. Go thy walk in my statutes, and keep my commandments. Behold, I am the Lord of glory. I was crucified for the world, that all those who believe on my name may have eternal life. Uh, Behold, the Lord lieth in sin, and at this time, and none doeth good, no, not one. They have turned aside from the gospel, and keep uh, keep not commandments. End quote. Okay. Um, the, (laughs) we're going to discuss the details of this in just a second. Um, but after that passage there, it switches again to Frederick G. Williams 
who tells about the bedside appearance of the unnamed angel. And this is right here. This is an addition in Freddie Willie's handwriting. Quote, And it came to pass when I was 17 years of age, I called again upon the Lord, and he shewed unto me a heavenly vision. For behold, an angel of the Lord came and stood before me, and it was by night, and he called me by name, and he said, The Lord had forgiven me my sins, and he had revealed unto me that in the town of Manchester, Ontario County, New York, there was plates of gold upon which there was engravings, which was engraven by Maroni and his fathers, the servants of the living God in ancient days, and deposited by the commandments of God and kept by the power thereof." End quote. I'm sorry for the disjointed reading and the run-on sentence. There are absolutely no punctuation marks in this entire thing. It's all just one sentence. Um, no capitalized words to mark the new thought or a new sentence. Nothing. It's all just these run-on sentences and ands, ands, ands to punctuate everything. It's it's terribly spelled, terribly hard to read, and uh, but it is important because this is the first account that we have of the first vision experience in Joseph Smith's own hand. But this is dated to 1832. That was written 10 years after the claimed occurrence, and this account was never actually published. However, this 1832 account is rather important for shaping how Mormon missionaries approached investigators in the early 1830s. Prior to this, they only had vague references to the history of the gold plates coming into Joseph's possession after an angelic manifestation. This 1832 account essentially codified the story and provided a place where elders and missionaries could fall back on when preaching of Joe's divinity, written by Joseph himself. The next accounts of this first vision experience come out of 1835 and 36. Now, these accounts don't differ all that substantially from the 1832 account, except for pushing the date to slightly earlier around 1820 to 21, and, you know, making the Sacred Grove appearance slightly more grandiose. By that, I mean that they changed the earliest manifestation, where Joe had previously claimed to see the heavens open and witness God. These 1835 and 36 accounts changed that to angels and then to God the Father appearing in the sacred grove. And they also changed the setting to the woods instead of the bedside manifestation. The subsequent accounts were each given at times when there was significant strife existing in the ranks of trusted Mormon elites. The 1832 account came along when Sidney Rigdon was claiming that Joe was in apostasy and he had lost the keys of the kingdom. These accounts from 32, 35 and 36 came in the wake of the Zion's camp debacle and amidst the uprising and popularization of the Spalding theory with widespread distribution and consumption of Mormonism Unveiled written by Eber Howe. That's the first anti-Mormon book. Each time one of these social pressures caused people to question Joe's divinity, another version of the first vision would come forth, each time becoming more grandiose and more miraculous. This is important, and we'll get to why. Finally, the Mormons were chased from Ohio, and they resettled in Missouri, where there was already a significant chapter of Mormons who'd been living there since around about 1832. It was during this time in 1838 that Joseph decided he needed a canonical account of his first vision experience to pass to his followers and progenitors. Beginning in 1838, Joe started dictating his personal history to multiple scribes. When Joe and Rigdon first made their way to Missouri in uh, about January, February of 1838, they purged the Missouri leadership, and they removed a number of people who were thought to be in error, including D-Day David Whitmer, Ollie Cowdung, and most importantly, John Goebbels Whitmer. Well, most importantly for us, specifically with the subject we're covering today. And that, why that's important is because John Whitmer had been given the esteemed office of the first official church historian. He'd compiled notes from the previous seven years from when he was initially given the job in 1831, and he started copying them into his uh, single history notebook. But when John Goebbels Whitmer was excommunicated, Joe and the leadership knew that they would no longer have access to his notes on early church history. Thus, a new history of the church needed to be composed. So Joe began the dictation of his history in early 1838 in response to losing this powerful resource from John Goebbels Whitmer. However, 1838 was a bit chaotic for the Mormons, as was 1839 during their exodus from Missouri to Illinois, so the project was put on hold for a brief time. 
Once the Mormons had settled in Illinois, the project was picked back up with John Corll and Elias Higby as official church historians, while Willard Richards, Joseph Smith, and Hingepin Rigdon all worked together to compile the history which they had documentation of, but many mysteries about their history still existed. Beginning in mid-1840, this group of historians and editors fervently conducted their efforts in earnest to push out a systematized and streamlined history of the church, which people could use when telling the history of the Gold Bible, Joseph Smith, and the saints to those who were inquiring after such information. However, the original history of the church from John Goebbels Whitmer was an important resource, and it was in the hands of an apostate a dissenter, somebody who is no longer a member of the trusted Mormon elite. Joseph Smith and Hinchman Sidney Rigdon wanted that history for a couple of reasons. If they could have Whitmer's history, it may shed some useful light on details that they didn't have or that were forgotten or, you know, they didn't have documentation of. So, I mean, that was, it was a valuable resource for what it contained. And that's a tough commodity to let go of, right? A history, a systematized history that was recounted by a firsthand witness. But for a more important point, it's a lot harder to leave that precious commodity in the hands of someone who had been excommunicated from the church. So back in 1838, Joe and Rigdon actually wrote a letter to the excommunicated John Whitmer in hopes of getting that history back from him. This is read from the josephsmithpapers.org on their historical introduction of the Whitmer history. Quote, after his estrangement from the church, Whitmer refused to relinquish the manuscript for printing. Two months after Whitmer's excommunication, Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon wrote him, now quoting the letter they wrote, quote, We were desirous of honoring you by giving publicity to your notes on the history of the Church of Latter-day Saints, after such corrections as we thought would be necessary. <laughs> after such corrections we thought would be necessary. Interesting little uh, line to put in there. It doesn't get much better. Knowing your incompetency as a historian and that your writings coming from your pen could not be put to the press without our correcting him, or else this church must suffer reproach. Indeed, sir, we never supposed you capable of writing a history, but were willing to let it come out under your name, notwithstanding it would really not be yours, but ours. <laughs> so they want to take his history, edit it significantly, release it under his name, as long as he knows that it's their book, not his. They finish with saying, We are still willing to honor you, if you can be made to know your interest in giving up your notes, so that they can be corrected and made fit for the press. But if not, we have all the materials for another, which we shall commence this week to write. End quote. Continuing on in response to this from the Joseph Smith Papers Project, there is no record of Whitmer responding to the condescending letter, and the church leaders soon made other arrangements. John Corll and Elias Higby had already been assigned as historians, and within three weeks of writing to Whitmer, Joseph Smith himself began to prepare a new history with the assistance of Sidney Rigdon and scribe George W. Robinson. End quote. Very fascinating. And these men would actually share a similar letter exchange in the future concerning the Whitmer history again, but... Old John Goebbels never coughed up the goods. Whitmer's history of the church remained in the RLDS archives until Dean Jesse and later the Joseph Smith Papers Project were granted access to copy and publish it online. Now, we have to be careful when referring to the history of the church as an actual history. Never forget this. History is written by the victor, and the history of the church was compiled at a time when dissent and persecution were at the greatest levels ever experienced by anyone in the church prior to this time. But people were constantly asking, and small articles were being published in Chicago and England telling the history of Mormonism the way the Mormon elite wanted it to be told. While on his mission in Europe in 1840, Orson Brainpower Pratt published a little booklet titled Interesting Account of Several Remarkable Visions, which included a copy of Joseph's history the way that it would be printed in the Times and Seasons beginning in 1842. This shows us that even though the Joseph Smith history we know wasn't published until 1842, they were working on it and had functional drafts to publish in other outlets like Orson Pratt's book back in 1840. 
Try to think of the history of the church as an official statement release from the church in the early 1840s that members, non-members, and media outlets could use in any format that they wished. But it's only that. It's just a press release. There's a lot of truth underlying that lies in between the lines that you have to understand the broader context of Mormon history in order to tease out of the history of the church. Now, all of this discussion about the various versions of Joseph's history surrounding the first vision leads us to what happened in early 1841. It was an interview. This interview that we're about to read through is why we've spent so much time talking about the progression of the versions of the first vision and why this subject was particularly relevant in 1841 and is just as relevant to us as we are progressing through 1841 in our historical timeline. This was a public statement issued by Joseph's younger brother, Crazy Willie Smith, and it was given aboard a steamboat on the Ohio River. Here's a few relevant excerpts from the interview, which I'm reading from Francis Kirkham's A New Witness for Christ in America, Volume 2, Second Edition, published in 1967. You'll find a link to it in the show notes. Quote, the statements present briefly one of the most remarkable exhibitions of the obliquities and follies of the human mind in its religious speculations, which the history of this age records. Joseph Smith, now 35 years of age, is the eldest of five brothers. That's not accurate. All born at Norwich in the state of Vermont. It was actually Hiram Smith who was the oldest surviving uh, brother of the Smith clan. Uh, anyway, there are a few factual inaccuracies in here, but this is all from William Smith himself, so take that for what it's worth. In the year 1816 or 17, the whole family removed to the state of New York and lived sometimes in Palmyra and sometimes in the adjacent town of Manchester. They were in rather low circumstances and followed farming. About the year 1823, there was a revival of religion in that region, and Joseph was one of several hopeful converts. The others were joining, some one church and some another in that vicinity, but Joseph hesitated between the different denominations. While his mind was perplexed with this subject, he prayed for divine direction, and afterwards was awaked one night by an extraordinary vision. The glory of the Lord filled the chamber with a dazzling light, and a glorious angel appeared to him and told him that he was a chosen vessel of the Lord to make known true religion. The next day he went into the field but was unable to work, his mind being oppressed by the remembrance of the vision. He returned to the house and soon after sent for his father and brothers from the field, and then in the presence of the family, my informant, one of them, you know, this is all saying that, you know, William Smith is giving the interview, he is a first-hand witness of all of this. He related all that had occurred. They were astounded, but not altogether incredulous. After this, he had other similar visions, in one of which the existence of certain metallic plates was revealed to him, and their location described, about three miles off in a pasture ground. The next day, he went alone to the spot, and by digging discovered the plates of some sort of a rude stone box. They were eight or ten inches long, less in width, about the thickness of panes of glass, and together made a pile of about five or six inches high. They were in a good state of preservation, had the appearance of gold, and bore inscriptions and strange characters on both sides. He brought them home, but was unable to read them. I'm going to take a brief pause here. So, this is all taken from William Smith himself. That is who is giving this interview to the Reverend Murdoch, who was conducting the interview. He was able to remember these plates with explicit detail. He was also able to remember Joseph um, claiming that he was visited in the middle of the night by a, an angelic spirit, and he remembers Joseph becoming weak the following day in the field and collapsing and calling his father and brothers over to tell them the story of the, the angelic manifestation. But he can't relay some other important details. He can't remember that ever-important detail of Joseph telling people about the Sacred Grove experience three years prior when he saw God and Jesus in human form, but he does remember the measurements of the plates when he saw them? I, I can't, I can't reconcile this. This is, the fickleness of memory is something to contend with on a constant basis. And, you know, this is 20 years after the supposed occurrence, so take that for what it's worth. But he's able to remember the measurements of the plates, but he can't remember the details of Joseph telling his family about the appearance of God and Jesus. He only talks about the angel appearing in his chamber room in 1823. Very fascinating that that detail is just wholly absent from William Smith's account. 
And this is 1841, right? This is long after there had been stories circulating of Joseph, you know, seeing God and Jesus in the sacred grove. 1841, Joseph's own younger brother doesn't relay the detail of the sacred grove experience. That's baffling to me. We'll continue on with uh, reading this. Just one more excerpt out of this. He afterwards made a facsimile of some parts of the inscription and sent it to Professor Anthon of New York City. Now, if you guys will remember, this is way back to the, like, episode five, six of the episode when we were talking about Not So Smarty Marty taking this character's manuscript to Professor Anthon. The professor pronounced the characters to be ancient Hebrew corrupted and the language to be degenerate Hebrew with a mixture of Egyptian, which that none of that is accurate either. None of that is accurate, but that is how it was remembered by Mormons. He could decipher only one entire word. That's not accurate as well. He sent Martin Harris out of that, the, the his office saying that you are being preyed upon by rogues. Hmm. After this, Joseph Smith was supernaturally assisted to read and to understand the inscription, and he was directed to translate a great part of it. The pages which he was not to translate were found to be sealed together, so that he did not even read them and learn their contents. With an assistant to correct his English, he translated so much of the transcription as now makes the Book of Mormon. He kept the plates a long time in his chamber, and after translating from them, he repeatedly showed them to his parents and to other friends. But my informant said he had never seen them. Now that is a fascinating detail, isn't it? Joseph Smith showed the the plates to other people, but my informant said he had never seen them. But William Smith gave a very explicit description of the size of the plates, even saying that they were of gold cast. I mean, their appearance of gold, sorry. And he is claiming that he didn't even see the plates. I, I don't know what to make of this. I mean, memory is obviously a fickle and, and fleeting thing to try and, uh, you know, ascribe any fact to, but still, this, this rings a lot of false bells or false memory bells when we are examining this account from William Smith. It sounds a lot like there are some details that have been misremembered, maybe, uh, confabulated with other occurrences and possibly even wholly fabricated at some level. Very interesting. And then it goes on to say, at length, he was directed to bury the plates again in the same manner, which he accordingly did. Now, that was actually folklore that circulated, that Joseph just took the plates and buried them back in the Hill Cumorah. There are a number of explanations for what happened with the plates. Oliver Cowdery was claiming that he went with Joseph Smith into the Hill Cumorah, where he saw enough plates to fill wagon loads. At least that's what Brigham Young claimed that Oliver Cowdery had said. Um, Joseph uh, said at uh, one point that the angel Moroni had come and taken the plates back to heaven with him. Here, William Smith, his own brother, is saying that Joseph held onto the plates for a little while and then went and buried them back in the same place. The fact of the matter is we don't know what happened to these plates. And I think that most historians would agree that Joseph had a set of plates. Um, the way that he was able to acquire said plates, I think, is um, something that's a bit conjectural. And, um, you know, it kind of falls on the belief spectrum where you sit on that belief spectrum, where your, um, you know, dictates what your opinion is of how he was able to ascertain these plates. But still, that being said, there's no real historical consensus with what happened with the plates afterwards. Now, if you believe Charles Anthon, he claimed that Martin Harris came and tried to sell the plates to him in a sealed box and said that I'll only give you the plates or I'll only sell these to you if you promise not to open them when I'm in the room. <laughs> Very interesting. So let's uh, let's finish up the account here. The Book of Mormon is Mr. Smith's professed translation of the inscription on the plates, and it bears the name of Mormon because a Jewish Christian of the 4th century bearing the name Mormon is the alleged author of the inscription. And then he goes on to actually detail the, the basic plot line of the Book of Mormon. We're not going to read that. Mr. Smith, with no great difficulty, persuaded his parents, his four brothers, and a few others to acknowledge his prophetic character and to embrace his views. But from the mass of the people, he met with ridicule and opposition. At the end of three or four years, he could number only a hundred followers. Afterwards, he was more successful, and now, A.D. 1841, he has perhaps 15,000 adherents. A large body of them reside at Nauvoo in the state of Illinois, where Mr. Smith himself lives and has fixed the center and capital of that sect. 
The rest are scattered over the United States and in Europe. Three heads of the sect are now laboring in England, Scotland, and Ireland, where they meet with much success. End quote. Once again, no mention of the sacred grove with God and Jesus appearing to Joseph. This is Joseph's younger brother giving the interview in 1841 when the story of God and Jesus in the sacred grove had been circulated to a few individuals. It had been printed in the Chicago Tribune. I mean, how did his own brother, who had witnessed these powerful times in the 1820s with his own eyes, just forget that detail about his own brother's story? He was there. He saw Joe's legs refuse their faculty and collapse in the front yard of their home in 1823 after the angel had visited. He saw the plates and he left an incredibly detailed description of their size in spite of the fact that, um, you know, Murdoch reported that his informant said that he never saw the plates. Crazy Willie Smith saw Joe disappear into the woods two to four times throughout the 1823 to 27 and then come back with these unbelievable stories of his great trials with the spirits who was in charge of guarding the sacred gold plates. William Smith is one of the few contemporary accounts who could provide details of Joe's story pre-1830 and at this crucial time when the history of the church was being compiled to be published in the Times of Seasons. Crazy Willie couldn't relay the details of Joseph's theophany in the sacred grove. All right, let me craft an analogy. Look, if you have kids and you come into the kitchen only to find the cookie jar with the lid off and then six cookies missing, you know, if that kid thinks that they're in trouble, chances are they're going to lie about it. It was their infant sibling who took the cookies. It was the cat. It was their favorite superhero on Paw Patrol. Or maybe the more inventive of the kids out there will say it was their imaginary friend who snuck in and took the cookies. Some of the more audacious children out there may go as far as providing an explanation instead of blame shifting. Maybe that the imaginary friend wanted the kid to have a cookie and told them to steal the cookies. People, kids especially, are going to lie when it serves their best interest. Many people don't lie when they're in trouble or when doing so would be better for them, but society doesn't tend to favor those kinds of people in the short term because facts don't matter. But Joseph's story matters. The first thing those nice 19-year-old young men and women will tell you when you ask what the Book of Mormon is will inevitably come to the story of a young man who went out into the woods and prayed to God to ask which of all the religions were true. After struggling with the adversary, God answered by appearing with his son, Jesus, in a pillar of light over this 14-year-old's head to tell him that all the religions are false and that he would restore the one true religion to the continent in the latter days. The angel Moroni appeared to Joseph in his room one September night three years later and gave him instructions of where to find the gold plates which contained the history of an ancient people on the American continent, and four years later he attained the gold plates. This story, relayed by missionaries, is a fabrication, published 22 years after the actual incident. And the ability that historians have to chart the progress of Joe's theophany to becoming a legendary tale of Joseph Smith being actually visited by God and Jesus in the woods, and the appearance of an angel being the angel Moroni appearing to Joseph, delivering the plates and taking them back when he was finished, and you know being seen as this old man walking on the side of the road by Joe and his friends. I mean, all of the points that we can plot from the original draft of the story in 1829 – through 1832 to 1835 to 1836, and then now to the 1842, which is broadly used as the standard narrative, each of these points demonstrate the evolution of a legend. The way it is claimed never happened. Something did happen in the woods to Joseph Smith. But whatever it is has nothing to do with the legend as it stands today. And simple objections can be raised, like the fact that the angel was reported as the angel Moroni as early as 1831 in an affidavit in Mormonism unveiled, but then it was changed to the angel Nephi when it was published in the 1842 edition of the Times of Seasons and the 1851 edition of the Pearl of Great Price, and even in the memoir of Lucy Mack Smith, they all report the angel as Nephi. But then it was changed again to Moroni in the 1852 History of the Church published in the Deseret News. 
I mean, that that objection right there is tantamount to Lucas saying that Han Solo's father is Mace Windu, who cut Solo's legs off at the mouth of a volcano. I mean, that's just a simple objection. More objections can be provided in that some Mormon historians have documented more than 55 occurrences of an angel meeting with Joseph from 1823 to 1835. As if a person hallucinating something dozens of times instead of four times make the hallucination more plausible. But those are just incidental, minor objections to the story. The main problem is that it's obviously a fabrication. It's made up! Each time something would come up in Mormon history where Joe needed a larger and more grandiose story to make his claim to divine provenance more unique, his story evolved. That's Joseph Smith, his story. Joe's Genesis story as a prophet was just as important to people in the 1840s as it is to Mormonism today, and Joe recognized that. But how did this all come about? What's a naturalistic explanation for this evolution of the legend of Joseph Smith? So, Brother Joseph, tell us again about how you got the gold plates. Well, brother, I'm glad you asked. My soul was racked with that great question, which of all religions is true? An angel appeared to me while I was supplicating by my bedside, and he told me the Lord would deliver an ancient record of the early inhabitants of this continent. Finally, after years of instruction, the angel directed me to the place where the record was buried with the seer stones, which helped me to translate the inscriptions into the Book of Mormon. Who was this angel who appeared to you? It was the same Nephi who wrote the first books in the Book of Mormon. Why would it be Nephi? Wasn't Moroni the prophet who buried the abridged gold plates in Hill Cumorah? Well, Nephi appeared to me, but it was the angel Moroni who directed me to their resting place. Brother Joseph, how do we know this was a good spirit which appeared to you? Well, because God appeared to me and assured me that it was an angel of the Lord. Wait, what? God appeared to you? When? Yes, God appeared to me. It was a couple of years before the angel appeared. Was it Jesus, or was it God? Both. Both? Yes, both God and Jesus appeared to me before the angel did and told me that I would start the one true religion. But Brother Joseph, I thought you were caught up in the sin and vanities of life at the time. How do we know it was actually God and Jesus and not familiar spirits? Well, when God appeared to me, he told me that my sins were forgiven. You mean God and Jesus, right? Yes, of course. Just like I said earlier, God and Jesus appeared and told me that my sins were forgiven and that all religions are evil and their professors corrupt. Did you tell anybody of this when it happened? Well, well, I, I told my family, but nobody would believe me. So then I waited until now to tell all of you about it. Hmm. Seems legit. Pass the pipe, brother. You're totally babysitting. (laughs) So stupid. Long-time listeners will know that we've talked about the First Vision account and the historical issues with them in the past, but it's worth rehashing at this time when the Mormons were doing everything possible in Nauvoo to be seen as a legitimate religious movement. And this very story was one of the main points the missionaries and the elites used to sell the prophet to those who were skeptical of his claims of you know being a prophet. However, We have to put ourselves in the mindset of these people at the time when the stories were told. Likely, none of the people hearing Joe's story in the 1840s were aware of his 1832 account, which was unpublished. Most of them had probably never heard about the 1835 or 36 version, but only had the section from the Doctrine and Covenants written by Oliver Cowdery to fall back on. So, Joe expanding on the details of the Doctrine and Covenants version of the First Vision seems acceptable when we don't have all of the other versions with which to compare in order to chart the progress of this history. For many of these people, when Joseph was elaborating on his own history, not in any written format, that was the first time they were hearing this, even long-time followers of Mormonism. But the point is, with Mormonism back then, just as much as today, this story matters. If the very story that you use to sell the prophet's divinity is a fabrication at any level, how can the religion itself not be a fabrication? The answer seems rather clear to yours truly, because it is a fabrication. 
Mormonism may be a world religion with 16 million claimed adherents today and tens of thousands of salesmen pushing the product to the unwashed masses, you know, mostly to third world countries without internet access lately, but it was made up. And really, I pity the person who stuck with the burden of proof that Joseph was a legitimate prophet of God's. That's something which is much harder to prove today than it was during Joe's life. What was a prophet to these 19th century Christians? A person who speaks for God? A person who gives divine revelations, predicts the future, and leads people as the prophets of old? Joe claimed to be all of those things, and when challenged, he would just pile a lie on top of another lie, because facts didn't matter then, and they apparently don't matter now. But we can check this stuff now. We can use information from the church itself to prove that Joe was lying at some level with the first vision account. And maybe lying is too inflammatory a word to use, but maybe a better interpretation would be misremembering. But that means that a person who supposedly had an open conduit to God's somehow couldn't remember the most important moment of his life, at least when it came to the details of the angel's name, the time it happened, whether it was an angel or God or gods in the sacred grove, you know, just those minor details that one usually forgets with a life-changing experience. I mean, this isn't what Joe had for breakfast or the name of a person who had hired him 10 years ago. This is God giving him the most important mission of his life. Nay, giving him the entire purpose of his life. How the hell does a person just misremember that? A representative for God, you would think, should be an honest person. But I've yet to find a single example in Joe's life where he was stalwart, honest, and forthcoming in his dealings with his fellow men. Instead, we have a career of chaos punctuated by 42 arrests or court hearings, and the only constant was Joe's ability to lie on the spot to serve his needs at that given moment. Seeing these later progressions and developments of Joe's theology put into proper historical context of when they were released paints a picture of somebody not constrained by truth or the morality of his time. But... That's merely my deduction and speculation from seeing the crime scene of Mormon history laid out in front of me. We must never forget who Joseph Smith really was. The atheist and freethinker movement seems like an aspect of only recent history. Since September of 2001, a new uprising in atheism brought out the four horsemen of the atheist apocalypse. Sam Harris, Dan Dennett, Christopher Hitchens, and Richard Dawkins, of course. And the atheist and freethinking movement has been growing ever since. It may surprise some of you to know that a movement of freethinkers isn't actually all that new in America. Our next guest is a public historian researching the rise of the free-thinking movement in the 19th century in his leisure time. He's the host of the Reason Revolution podcast and recently started a YouTube channel about Midwest history. Please join me in welcoming Justin Clark. Justin, thank you for joining us. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Absolutely. I want to get the most important question out of the way first. What is a Hoosier? (laughs) <laughs> That's a great question. So I'll try to give you the Cliff Notes version. So a Hoosier is basically anybody who's from Indiana, either by birth or by by sort of uh, by spirit, I guess. Um, there are competing stories about how the term Hoosier came about. Um, the one that and I this was is kinda, not considered. This is not recognized as a legitimate genetic defect, right? No, I no, make no, sure. no, no. Oh, okay. No, okay. Um, <laughs> the, the term itself has a, a variety of different um, origin stories. The one that I always liked the most as a kid that I heard in fourth grade history class was um, there was two. There were two men fighting in a bar, and it got really, really rough. One got hurt real bad, and the bartender looked down at the floor and, and saw something on it. Picked up what was down there on the floor and said, "Whose ear? Whose ear?" <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I like it. So that's the funny. That's the funny version. The probably the real version is that Hoosier is a term um, that likely started in the state of Virginia. Uh, most people who live in Indiana are what you would call upland Southerners. So a lot of them um, were uh, English or um, uh, German immigrants. A lot of them uh, started either in Virginia or in Maryland, and then eventually made their way to, to Kentucky. And then for those who didn't go to Ohio or Illinois. They went right smack dab in the middle and they went to Indiana. So Hoosier basically sort of means wow. a country bumpkin um, or or sort of a backwoodsman. 
character. But okay, to, the original redneck, right? The original the, the redneck in a lot of, of ways, yeah. It's okay. it's a, yeah, right it's on. sort of a proto redneck term. But today, <laughs> it's just a word that's just used to describe people from Indiana. Um, and it always reminds me of uh, a quote of Kurt Vonnegut's, although he didn't say this lovingly. I think he was saying it ironically, but he says, you go anywhere in the world and you'll find a Hoosier doing something important. <laughs> Touche to that. <laughs> so uh, you uh, you actually work as a public historian. Do you mind telling us a little bit about uh, maybe uh, what it is that you study specifically both for your work life and in your leisure time? Because, y- you know, you and I have shared a bit of correspondence on Facebook and I'm quite fascinated with what, you know, you're, you're kind of bringing to the table today. Let's let's dive right in. Great. So I'm a public historian. Um, I work at an agency called the Indiana Historical Bureau. Um, it's a, the only state, fully state agency um, of Indiana history. The main project that we do is called the um, Statewide Marker Program. So if you come to visit Indiana and you see these uh, blue and gold signs on the sides of the road that tell you a little bit about history, that's the main thing that we do. Okay. But the, th- but the specific thing that I work on is a component to something called the National Digital Newspaper Program, um, which was started by Congress in 2004. It's a joint venture between the Library of Congress and the National Endowment for the Humanities. And I work on this, the Indiana division of that called Hoosier State Chronicles, which is our statewide digital newspaper program. Oh, I work, cool. I work digitizing historical newspapers. Um, and so I take newspapers, most of them are, are from the original printing, then they're put to microfilm. And then from there, they're digitized and we make them word searchable and date searchable and everything like that. Um, as somebody who reads those archives endlessly, thank you so much. (laughs) Seriously, it's one of the most valuable resources that historians have access to is being able to search newspapers that are indexed for entire time periods or by keywords and just pilfering through archives instead of having to go to a location and finding, you know, digging it out of one box in, you know, the Indiana Historical Society and whatnot. So seriously, thank you for doing what you do. That's just amazing. No problem. And just as a bit of an irony is that uh, the the our new vendor has a different location, but our old vendor who would do our microfilm digitization for us, a lot of the metadata was actually done out of Utah. So, oh, really? Uh, yeah, they can, they'll actually find a lot of like students at like BYU who need like a part time gig. Uh, oh, yeah. um, and so they'll hire them to do metadata entry for newspaper stuff. So that was, um, a lot of it they do for ancestry.com as well. There's like a yeah. huge ancestry <laughs> yeah. hub out in Utah from, if I am remembering correctly. So it's a bit of a, you know, fun connection there. Absolutely. So, so professionally, I study Indiana history. Um, pretty much anything related to Indiana history I work on. Um, and so I've done it in a variety of ways. So I've worked on podcasts before. The Bureau has a podcast called Talking Hoosier History, um, which is uh, an amazing podcast, about 20, 25 minutes each. And it's about a, each is a different historical subject from a different time period of Indiana history or relating to Indiana history. And I'm the voice of newspapers on that show. So anytime there's a newspaper quote, I will read it. Um, then we have our YouTube series, Hoosier State Chronicles. We launched a YouTube series um, back in, what is that now? Uh, November. And we've done about three or four videos now. And I'm working on a new one um, about uh, something called the Crawfordsville Monster, which is this, uh, this, this weird sighting that these two guys saw. Um, they were ice, they were ice mongers in the early morning. They saw something weird fly across the sky. And then it sort of sort of whipped up into a froth in the local newspapers in Crawfordsville, Indiana. And it turns out it was just a flock of birds. And so the, <laughs> so the whole, the whole point of the video will be about sort of whipping a lesson of, Hey, you know, you know, we, we often think we live in an age of fake news, but fake news goes back a lot farther and it's pretty easy to, to, um, to, uh, to con people, to, to, um, mm-hmm. to throw people off. So that'll be the next one we do. And then as for, uh, my specific area of expertise and the stuff that I sort of do with Reason Revolution and some of my lectures and my writing, um, is I'm an intellectual historian. So I study the history of ideas and how they relate to, um, uh, what people do. So I always go into, to my, my, um, research on intellectual history with three central questions. Um, what, did people believe why do they why did they believe it and what and and what about what they believed informed their actions so that's kind of the three things i'm very interested in and that's those are obviously very 
uh, tough questions to answer in some cases because I find myself uh, struggling with people's motivations constantly. I mean, especially when you're looking back, you know, let's say 150 years into the past, trying to ascertain why somebody did something, it, you know, whether or not they sincerely believed what they did. It's it's a never ending challenge for historians to try and figure out. So th- those are, those are some uh, powerful central questions to try and dig to the roots of. And uh, yeah, obviously there's an endless well of information to dig through to try and you know get at the heart of those questions. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I think for me, at least, you know, the one thing that, you know, I think you you well know as being, you know, in, in some respects, I think um, what we call in our space a citizen historian, someone who maybe not necessarily has like the the academic background. Uh, I'm not sure if you have a history degree or not, but, but, um, but who may not have the academic background, but has a serious I'm interested in scholarship, and from what I've heard from your show and, and the history that you've you've given uh, your listeners about um, the history of the Mormon Church, it's fascinating stuff, and it sort of plays into the kind of stuff that I research as well. And you know, I think with history, it's sort of necessarily deductive. You're sort of like a detective, so you imagine it as you're living. You sort of see the crime scene, and the crime scene has evidence, and with the pieces of evidence that are sort of left behind, you can make conclusions. History yeah. is the same way. So it's imperfect. Um, and I think it's very important that we as historians make a clear distinction between what we absolutely know based on the sources and then sort of what we can conjecture and some of the major themes we can, can draw for that. Fortunately absolutely. for, fortunately for me, the historical subject that I spent most of my graduate work um, studying um, was pretty damned vocal and pretty clear about exactly what he was and what he was doing and why he was doing it. So I was very lucky. I want to get into that. And um, I, I the way uh, I want to kind of touch on something you were saying earlier is, um, you know, I actually don't have uh, training in, in any historical degree or anything to that aspect, but I consider myself a history communicator. Um, and it's necessary to understand kind of some of the uh, foundation of what it is to create historical theories and be able to communicate those effectively and then being able to compile information from a number of historians and communicate that effectively. Um, and uh, people who are non-historians like myself can do that as long as we are very careful with what we do. And, you know, sometimes I kind of uh, play with those boundaries a little bit, but I think it's important to have historians communicating with history communicators as well and to have a rare um, person like your Yourself, who is a historian as well as a history communicator, because that's very important to try and communicate the fun stories that people can latch on to and, and, you know, tell their friends around, you know, at the pub, but also to be able to say, well, this is how we know this information. This is the uh, the documentation behind this fun story that we talk about in history. So there's definitely a balance to play with there. I definitely, you know, I fall further on the side of just history communication, but I'm glad that you are, you know, somebody who is able to provide kind of both of those outlets where you spend your, your days studying history and your nights podcasting and making YouTubes about history. That's really a, a valuable uh, career and a valuable thing to provide for society, I think. Well, thank you so much. And, and it's part of the it's part of my view of citizenship, which is a word that doesn't often get said a lot these days. It's, I guess it's kind of old fashioned, but I, I always have believed deep down ever since I was a little kid and got obsessed with Abraham Lincoln as a fourth grader <laughs> that, um, that history was, is a window into becoming a better citizen. And, and by learning history and learning lessons from history, um, we can be better people and we can be better citizens. And so that's sort of what motivates me. Um, history communication is a really new and burgeoning field. And I think that podcasting really is one of the ways in which history communication is becoming, I think, huge. I think your podcast is an excellent example of history communication. Thank um, you. you're welcome. And there are other ones that are really, really great. Like if people during the, the 2016 election, the Washington Post had a podcast called Presidential and oh, each, yes. uh, and each episode was about a particular president. And, and it was really, I thought it was very well done. And the host was a, was a columnist for the Washington Post and she spoke with different scholars, both from the Library of Congress and other presidential libraries and just other academic historians about the presidents. I think my goal as somebody who's trained in, in, in professional history, as well as somebody who's a history communicator, is taking my two loves, which is um, scholarship, really getting in, looking at the sources, making conclusions, figuring out what happened, 
and storytelling. I think it's very important that we we remember the story part of history. We often, I think, neglect that. And so I remember when I was applying for graduate programs that I knew I wanted to do something a little different. And when the opportunity arose to do the public history program at Indiana University, uh, Purdue University, Indianapolis, or IUPUI, um, that was it. I knew that was what I wanted to do. And I did that. That was, I started that program going on four years ago. I completed my master's thesis last year and graduated last year and then started my job. So I love it. And I'm really looking forward to what the future brings. I think, Absolutely. so I, so I, I'm, I'm, I think that we're at a really fun time and a really exciting time because I've, I, I describe it as being sort of the end of the beginning. We've sort of opened the door and now we're sort of walking walking in and and it's very nice and inviting and i think that there's there's um there's so much potential absolutely and it's uh it's kind of fun to grab out a flashlight and shine it on certain parts of this room that we just walked into and kind of discover what what what, what lays before us yeah uh, and i i want to uh, explore a little bit of what you and i have corresponded about um over our facebook messaging and that's your studies of the rise of kind of the free thinking movement i mean mm-hmm. you said that you like to study or that, that kind of your expertise is in studying ideas and kind of the genesis of these ideas and this is something you know as per the introduction that is viewed oftentimes as a fairly new movement, but it's definitely not. I mean, on the grand scheme of things, it's not thousands and thousands of years old, but as far as like American history goes, the rising up of popular free thinking is uh, a little bit older than we might think. Can we go ahead and uh, broach that subject and kind of start wherever you feel comfortable? Absolutely. So uh, I think a great way to start is how I sort of discovered this truth. So, uh, I'm a huge fan of Penn and Teller, uh, the magicians Penn and Teller, and I love Penn Jillette. And Penn Jillette did an interview, this maybe goes maybe five, six years, seven years ago now. And someone asked him, they said, is today the best time in America to be an atheist? And he said, no. And they asked, really? well, what was? He goes, well, probably the 18, the late 1800s, the 1880s or 1890s. And they asked him why. And he said, well, the two most popular and well-respected and quite frankly, um, uh, lucrative public speakers in America in that the turn of the, the 20th century, um, were, uh, Robert Ingersoll and Mark Twain. And most people know who Mark Twain is. I mean, he's Mark Twain, Yeah. but the other guy is the other guy most people don't know. And so I was intrigued by who is this Robert Ingersoll guy and never heard of him before. And so I just did a quick Google search. And found that he was just this extraordinary man who led this extraordinary life and in many ways was sort of the, the, the Richard Dawkins of his time or the Christopher Hitchens of his time. Um, I think it's probably more appropriate to call him Hitchens. I would say probably the 19th century equivalent of Richard Dawkins would be Thomas Henry Huxley, um, mm-hmm. who is known as Darwin's bulldog. Um, he was a biologist, <laughs> he, he was a biologist and lecturer who sort of gave lectures popularizing the ideas of evolution. Most people in the 19th century, if they knew something about evolution, it wasn't likely because they either read Darwin or knew of Darwin. It's because of Thomas Huxley. Mm-hmm. And Ingersoll was somebody who intrigued me. And then I just sort of discovered his life and discovered that not only was he important, but that there was this whole period that was very important. Today, scholars generally call it the golden age of free thought. So it sort of starts in roughly around 1870. So it starts right after the Civil War. And it goes till about World War One, and there's a reason for that. So, in times of in times of relative peace, uh, religious um, devotions tend to dwindle. Uh, wars, and particularly wars where you have to sort of uh, gin up support for them on a national level or at sort of a cultural level, they often sort of revive religion. And if you look at World War One and World War Two, that was especially the case. Um, I've, I've it's, it's a powerful tool for uh, tribalism, right? Yes. I mean, it, what way to, what better way to uh, drum up support inside your tribe than saying that we share the same God, right? Absolutely, and it's also sort of an economy of attention, right? When, when the mm-hmm. world's on fire, it's very hard to entertain ideas that aren't the mainstream. And Fair enough. And, uh, which is why I've always made the argument that if the two world wars wouldn't have happened, that the, the, the civil rights and e- equality movements of the sixties and seventies would have happened, um, in the 1890s or 1900s or 1910s, because all of the seeds of them are there. 
But anyway, but anyway, so the free, the golden age of free thought. So there was a, a group of leaders and writers and activists and newspaper publishers and um, authors who uh, articulated a vision of, of, of skepticism or, or broadly free thought. Um, the term free thought itself goes all the way back to the 1700s from a pamphlet called A Discourse on Free Thinking, which was written by an Englishman who I believe his last name is Hutchison or Hutchinson. Um, and he Hitch- basically makes Hitchens. It- it's Hitchens. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm thinking Christopher Hitchens, but that's a little before his time. <laughs> um, I think, I think his name might be either Francis Hutchison or something like that. Okay. But a discourse on free thinking is a terrific little pamphlet that was written, basically arguing that nothing is above criticism, not even religion, and that the wow. free thought mindset is tied into the idea of freely examining. Uh, ideas based upon the faculty of reason and reason alone. And so that's sort of where the term free thought comes from. Uh, the term, uh, the term secularism really sort of took off and became a thing from, uh, the, another British man by the name of George Jacob Holyoke, who was, who was another late 19th century, um, skeptic author who actually had a correspondence with Ingersoll for many, many years. I've said that if I were to ever to go back and do more research, um, I would do, uh, an essay or an article about the correspondence between Ingersoll and, um, Holyoke. So I'll, um, I'm, I, 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 I feel like I'm, I, I feel like I've talked around him and I need to talk about him. So Robert Ingersoll was known as the great agnostic. Um, he was a lawyer. He was a political, um, operative. He was personal friends with three presidents. He campaigned for every president basically between 1868 uh, and 1900. Um, wow. Uh, well, 1896, uh, I think with the exception of maybe one. Um, but he, uh, was very well known within the Republican party, was considered at one point for secretary of state, although his, his anti-religious views sort of, um, put an end to that. Uh, he was then considered for ambassador to Germany and that became a whole mess because obviously he was a, he was a godless heathen. Mm-hmm. So Ingersoll, was a man of incredible privilege and wealth and success. And he was a lawyer for the railroads. He made a lot of money doing that and was very, uh, just very well off. And he could have just lived on his laurels politically. Um, but he decided within starting basically within the, the early to mid 1870s to start writing lectures critical of religion. And it really starts with one of the very first lectures he ever wrote, which was in the early 1870s. Um, late 1860s, early 1870s, um, on the German naturalist Alexander von Humboldt, um, who was this sort of geog- geologist and geographer, and Thomas Jefferson sort of made him a scientist lord of the United States and shit like that. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, it, from this, you get one of Ingersoll's classic lines, just to give you a sense of his language and how he used language. So he says, um, give me the storm and tempest of thought and action rather than the dead calm of ignorance and faith. Banish me from the garden of Eden, if you will, but first let me eat of the, of the tree of the fruit of the tree of knowledge. Wow. Wow. I love that. So he's, so he, he has this sort of beautiful language and in that regard, you know, he was, um, very influenced by Thomas Paine. And if you read, okay. and, and Ingersoll did quite a bit in his life to sort of rehabilitate Thomas Paine's reputation because when Thomas Paine published his two part pamphlet series, The Age of Reason, where he criticizes openly Christianity, he was actually ostracized in a lot of ways from the, 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 the heritage of the American Revolution. Mm-hmm. Um, so much so that in, in years later, uh, Tom, uh, uh, Theodore Roosevelt called him a filthy little atheist. <laughs> um, but, but Ingersoll was also heavily influenced by um, the poet Robert Burns and William Shakespeare. He said that Shakespeare is my Bible and Burns is my hymn book. Oh, wow. And, you know, we always talk about that there's the quote that's attributed to Isaac Asimov that uh, properly read, the Bible is the most potent force for atheism in the world. And And I've always said that people who are from religion, who leave it, there's a reason why, because they know the religion so well that they realize it's nonsense. And in some respects, Ingersoll did that. His father was John Ingersoll, who was a Presbyterian minister. 
and was a, a huge sort of moral leader within what we now call the Second Great Awakening, which happens before the Civil War. Mm-hmm. And he was sort of a revivalist preacher in a lot of ways, but not a fire and brimstone one. In fact, he was actually a strong advocate for the abolition of slavery. Um, and to give you a little bit more context, and this ties in, I think, interesting to what your research is. Ingersoll was born in 1833 in Dresden, New York. And if you know oh, wow. anything about that area of the state, it's what's called the Burned Over District. Yeah. So he's- Interesting to find uh, somebody who uh, <laughs> came uh, came so far on the other end of the you know religious belief spectrum come out of the Burned Over District. Mm-hmm. Wow. So he's right in there with, with, you know, whether it's Joseph Smith or sort of the radical, what would become the radical, um, beginnings of the women's rights movement as well. Mm-hmm. So Ingersoll is in his time was sort of a pamphleteer. So he would go from city to city to give these lectures and the lectures he would give would be on a variety of topics. So he would lecture one night, he would do a lecture on Abraham Lincoln or Shakespeare and the other, and the next night he would do a lecture where he would criticize and point out flaws in the old Testament. He was a guy who sort of was a, was a polymath and an autodidact. He taught himself everything. He read everything. And what he was really good at and what I argue in my thesis and why I argue argue that he's a public intellectual was that he was very good at synthesizing what he learned about philosophy, history, science, art, theology, um, and, and literature and synthesize that into a way that massive amounts of people could understand and could ingest and learn something from. And I always think that's the goal of public intellectuals. He's often derided it in some uh, historical literature as being nothing more than just a fancy speech maker. And I make the case that no, he actually really wasn't. This was a man of intensely deep ideas who, who used his power and his position in public life to sort of advocate for the principles of, of what we would broadly today call secular humanism. And, you know, that is often an interplay that comes out with, uh, you know, a lot of public speakers is you can have somebody who is incredibly brilliant and, you know, when they, they write something, it's the most poignant and beautiful work that you've seen. But, uh, when it comes to actually sitting on a stage and trying to deliver a lecture or, uh, you know, a banter with somebody like, say, in a public debate or something to that effect, not exactly the most well spoken off the cuff. They may not uh, be able to elucidate thoughts very well. They may think of something after the fact that they wanted to include or say, but didn't happen to occur at the right time. I mean, that, that's obviously the case. And then uh, there are, you know, those others who are great at public speaking and are just, you know, that whatever their writings are, whatever they take down to, uh, you know, take time to sit down and write and, and actually property and properly think out may not be the most um, articulate or interesting information or may just be vacuous platitudes or something to that effect. So there's obviously a balance to kind of strike there. But it sounds uh, from what you're saying, it sounds like Ingersoll kind of happened to have the best of both worlds where he was able to communicate these incredibly broad and uh, complex topics in a simple enough format. But he wasn't just delivering platitudes. He was he also understood the concepts of what he was uh, discussing and writing and lecturing about and was able to simplify those broad and complex issues into, you know, much more simpler and palpable formats, which obviously that is an incredibly invaluable resource for a person to be able to, you know, deliver to a populace. Yeah. And I think the other thing too is that he didn't do it by sacrificing language um yeah. he he used it he was a truly poetic writer i mean his and his writing um is definitely of the 19th century when you read it it certainly reads like that but it's not so difficult to read i, I find him very very readable thomas paine's the same way where it's there's a there's a sort of palpable but simple elegance to their writing that i think is incredibly um, evocative and, and engaging and inspiring. Uh, in terms of debates, Ingersoll only did one public debate in his life. Uh, he primarily preferred doing his sort of sparring with, with the, the religious in a couple different ways. One would, he would basically, um, (laughs) he would sort of presage what James Randi would do in the 20th century with the spiritualist, uh, 
Uri Geller, where Geller would go to a town, he would sp- spend bend spoons and try to prove he could do all this kinds of shit. And then Randy would come in a couple days later and show the people, hey, this is how he did this, this is how he did that. Ingersoll right. kind of did the same thing with with preachers. Um, <laughs> in fact, I'm working on uh, an, uh, an, an, ad, uh, an adaptation of a chapter I wrote for my thesis for a, for a book on intellectual history about his sparring with the evangelical preacher Dwight Moody. Who's oh, best yes. known today as one of the founders of the Moody Bible College? Yeah, I was going to say that sounds like the Moody Bible Institute. Yep. He's he's okay. sort of the the father, the godfather of modern American evangelicalism. And basically, what they would do was uh, Ingersoll would come in town and he would do a lecture criticizing religion. And a couple of days later, uh, Moody would come in and give his lecture. Uh, and in fact, I actually found evidence um, that uh, they both were in St. Louis the same week and they both basically checked into the same hotel on the same day. Wow. Um, so they were sort of following each other as they were going across the country, especially within the last decade of their active life. So in the late 1880s into the 1890s. And, and what's so funny was uh, there's this really cute story that's likely apocryphal, but I okay. think it's illustrative of, of, of kind of what I'm trying to get across here. So there's a story about um, uh, Dwight, uh, Dwight Moody's getting off of, of a train, a train station. He sees a young newsboy who's selling pamphlets. And back then, I mean, news, you know, uh, newspaper pamphlets of lectures were like the social media of, the, of their day. You could buy them oh, for, yeah. for five to ten cents and you'd have a lecture from somebody who was in, in, the, in the town a couple weeks before. And so – uh, so it's, uh, this kid selling this pamphlet. It's like, Ingersoll in hell, Ingersoll in hell, five cents or whatever, Ingersoll in hell. And th- the story goes that Moody went up to this, this young kid and said, my child, if you are to sell his pamphlet, would you please sell mine? And so he gives him a stack. And so he, so the kid then, then goes, Ingersoll in hell, Moody on heaven. <laughs> Ingersoll on hell, Moody on heaven. Well, it turns out that, yeah, that story is probably apocryphal, but right. there really is a Moody lecture that was sold as a pamphlet called Heaven, and there really was an Ingersoll pamphlet sold called Hell. And so in my my chapter on this, I do a comparative analysis of the two essays and sort of show the, the, the similarities and comparisons and sort of where they would have rebutted each other and everything like that. Wow. Um, and so, you know – the other way that Ingersoll was interested in doing this kind of thing was um, in um, newspaper columns. So he would often he uh, it, he would often respond to critics in newspapers. So he would re- he would answer their questions about life and religion in 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 newspaper form. And I found this particularly when it came to Indianapolis. There was a free thought newspaper. Uh, in the 1880s in Indianapolis called The Iconoclast. It was published by a man named W.H. Lamaster, who was a free thought um, leader in and of itself. He was also an anti-temperance activist. Well, he printed and basically set up a conversation between Ingersoll and a, and a collection of different religious leaders. So one was like an evangelical, one was more of a liberal Christian, one was a Unitarian, one was a Catholic priest. And they all asked Ingersoll different questions and he responded to them. And they were printed as Ingersoll's answers to Indianapolis clergy. So they asked him okay. questions like, where do you, why, you know, why is there something rather than nothing? Was Jesus a real person? How can one be moral without God? The same questions we still get today right, from, right. from believers. Ingersoll was answering them over 120 years ago. So, and he's answering them, I think, with eloquence and with wit, and he's really good at it. Um, and so, you know, he's a, and he helped facilitate uh, the movement in a lot of ways. So he was uh, he was a leader within what was event, was originally called um, the the National Liberal League, which then became known as the American Secular Union. Oh wow! And there was an entire organization that was set up at the time uh, of, of free thought leaders from all across the country, some of which who were from Indiana, um, who would basically set up um, uh, campaigns for either lecture le- lecture circuits or um, protesting or setting up petitions with the government. Um, and so, organized sort of free thought has a heritage and that's sort of what I try to get across in um my my research. 
So I want to ask you, because history is nothing if we can't derive some lessons from the material that we're consuming here. So you said uh, you alluded to earlier that you see kind of an inverse relationship between when there's, uh, you know, national conflict, you know, domestic or abroad versus religiosity. And I, I want to ask what it is that we can kind of derive from that and maybe what your thoughts are on how we can – uh, spread the free thought movement, even if we happen to be heading into a time of more war and conflict, or if we continue our, you know, our period of great peace that we're, uh, we're part of right now. I, how do you think is the best way to communicate free thought and, you know, make it more viral than it has been you know, in, let's say, the past, uh, you know, few thousand years that we have written history? Yeah, that's a great question. And what I would say is that uh, the beauty is, and I think what really separates the golden age of free thought from sort of what I would call the second golden age of free thought, which I think we're sort of living in now, which I think in a lot of ways started. Actually, I take the, the beginning of that sort of second wave of, of goal of free thought. I, I take it back much earlier than a lot of people do. I know a lot of people sort of started with 9-11 and with the, the, the four horsemen and those guys, but I actually take it back far back to Madeline Murray O'Hare and the founding mm -hmm. of American atheists in the 1960s. Yeah. And her, her, her landmark cases getting rid of compulsory school prayer and Bible readings in public schools. Mm -hmm. So what I would argue is that the beauty is, is that the period we're living in now benefits from having the internet. And I know that's a cliche that people often say, but I think it's very true. One of the things that has been a, I think, a consequence of the internet is that we live in a very individualized and, dis and intellectually and informationally dispersed culture. There are no sort of central channels of information anymore. In Ingersoll's time, the, you know, you had the national newspapers, you had the local newspapers, you had telegram and, and wire services, and the early, early, early beginnings of the phonograph. And that's it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he, you know, he was uh, of the 19th century and he articulated as if he was of the 19th century. And I think that the, the movement fell apart because Ingersoll died. And when he died in 1899, the movement sort of lost its, its, for lack of a better phrase, it lost its spiritual leader. Mm -hmm. And people sort of moved on to different projects, whether it was women's suffrage or, or uh, temperance or progressivism. They sort of moved on, right? And the movement sort of died. I don't think the modern free thought movement will have that problem precisely because it's already kind of dispersed to begin with. Um, there's, there's sort of the, the more mainstream level of the, the free thought movement where you have like Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins, uh, you know, Daniel Dennett, Lawrence Krauss, uh, David Silverman now who runs American Atheist now. You have that sort of mainstream. And then there's, I think within atheism itself right now in modern free thought, there's also a counterculture. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, whether it's sort of the, 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 what the people within atheism and free thought who are advocating for social justice and how that's a huge divide right now in the atheist movement, that there's a bit of a schism. And again, history tells us based on what I've learned that these free thought organizations that have schisms, that's totally natural. They had them back in the 1880s and 90s as well. Well, yeah, and I, I kind of want to add into this um, saying schism implies that there's, uh, you know, cohesiveness to begin with already. But I don't know, you know, obviously the, the atheist free thought movement was a bit more seemingly cohesive even five years ago than it is now. And, and I don't know if that's necessarily just, um, the, the, aspect that I have seen in it. And that's when I kind of entered into this community and I'm just using my own anecdotal information based mm -hmm. on this and my own observations. But mm -hmm. it seems like they're, they're being implicit in the idea of what free thought is. There aren't any actual thought leaders, right? There are, there are people that we say, oh yeah, great debate, great book, so on and so forth. But there aren't, you know, the spiritual leaders that we might look to, um, you know, even 10 or 15 years ago in a free thought movement, uh, you know, after 9-11 happened, that we uh, – we are th these people who we have put up on pedestals like the Four Horsemen and, you know, Dave Silverman and stuff, they also say stuff that's wrong. And I think it's good to recognize that that happens and that people are able to call them out in their, you know, small media pockets. And what that represents is that there is not exactly the inherent cohesiveness that we may have – entertained the thought that we had a long time ago 
And I think that's okay. You know, cohesiveness does kind of um, imply that there is uh, a strength to the numbers, but there also needs to be diversity, right? You can have a monolith, but if the monolith doesn't have a wide base to stand upon, it's going to topple. So I think having small groups of, of free thought that disagree with each other broadens our horizons and uh, forces people to think outside of their box and maybe knock a couple holes in their echo chamber. And I think at the end of the day, that's probably a net benefit. No, I totally agree. Um, I wrote an article for my site called The Promise of Secular Humanism, where I argue for that exact thing, where I, I sort of argue that the beauty of humanism is that it's not much of an ism at all. There's sort of broad general principles that we believe in. So a dedication to, to science and in critical inquiry, um, the advocation, the, the ad, advocating um, science and critical thinking in our public policy, a dedication to ethics that are not rooted within um, uh, old doctrines and a commitment to liberal democracy. To me, those are the broad principles that tie humanism together. And then within that, you can sort of have what Robert, the philosopher Robert, Robert knows it called a utopia of utopias, where you have all of these different groups that all work to get, work together, but separately to achieve their ends. So, mm-hmm. you know, somebody like Sam Harris doesn't have the same sort of interests and goals as say somebody like, uh, you know, Sincere Carabo, who is a friend of mine, who is a, a secular social justice activist. And he's, a, and he's a incredibly, um, amazing voice within the secular community for his critique of Sam Harris and his critique of, um, uh, the sort of modern atheism. Um, and, and he comes at it from a perspective of intersectionality and social justice. So I think for me, the beauty of that, and, and this is where I think it echoes into my own research and looking at the late 19th century, because back then you had, you know, atheists and free thinkers who were pro-temperance, they were anti-temperance. There were those right. who were pro-suffrage and anti-suffrage. There were those who were more libertarian and sort of more limited government, more of them that were sort of progressive or socialist or anarchist. They were all over the place. And I think that's good because I think discourse is good. What I think we have that they didn't was that that we have the reputational sort of power to assert ourselves in a way that they didn't. Back then, it was very hard to actively call yourself a heathen. It was very hard. You know, Ingersoll was the exception. He was not the rule. And the reason he could be that was because people adored him for his political speeches and for his speeches uh, celebrating Lincoln and celebrating the 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 – the victory of the union and his speeches for presidential candidates and his connection to the Republican party. He used all of that as his parlaying into talking about religion. And we don't have to do that. We can just, we can just do it. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that's beautiful. And that's why I always say to people that if you can come out in some way as either an atheist or an agnostic or a skeptic or a humanist or a whatever, do it. If you're in a position to do it, do it. If you can't, I totally understand, you know, because sometimes it's hard. You may live with your parents still and it's a fundamentalist background. Don't, don't do that if it's going to harm your life. But if you can be out and proud about your non-belief, do it because you're doing it for every person that can't. Exactly. And so, uh, I think that diversity is good. I think that a, a marketplace of ideas in this space is good. And I'll go back to a great quote from, the co-president of the Freedom from Religion Foundation, Dan Barker, he said, in atheism, there are no followers. We are all leaders. And I think that's a way, I think that's a healthy way of looking at it. I think that's a very wonderful way to uh, to kind of bring our conversation to a, a central point to focus on. And um, I, I kind of echo your sentiment that now we have uh, the internet, we have an outlet where you and I are a couple of dudes talking, you know, 1500 miles apart from each other and talking about what it means to be uh, part of a free thought movement and how that is defined as well as the history of it. And it's thanks to the ability to get together on the internet and see your face on uh, Google Hangouts here that we are you know able to uh, to share these ideas with somebody who we may not have an agreement with or somebody who we may completely agree with and just to have these conversations and with all that said uh Justin I want to thank you so much for coming on and uh I will recommend everyone head over to the uh Reason Revolution podcast as well as the uh Who's Your State Chronicles YouTube channel and there will be links to the show notes in all of those uh Justin if people want to reach out to you how can they find you Oh, thank you so much. So you can, uh, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and Tumblr at The Daily Clerk. You can check out our website, reasonrevolution.org. 
Follow us on Facebook, facebook.com slash Reason Revolution. As for the work I do at the Bureau, uh, you can just search everything I do at HoosierStateChronicles.org. Um, that's where you can get links to the site, to search newspapers, as well as the blog. Awesome. There will be links to everything provided in the show notes. And once again, Justin, thank you for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. All right. That's going to do it for today. Once again, huge thanks to Justin from Reason Revolution for providing such an awesome interview and, and talking to us about the rise of the free thought movement in America. If you want to listen to me over on Justin's show, you can go uh, punch in Reason Revolution and find episode 36. And we talked about the origins of Mormonism, Utah Mormon culture, secular Mormonism, and the power of storytelling. And it was really a fun interview that I did over on the Reason Revolution podcast. So I would recommend if you'd like to hear us talking about Mormonism a bit specifically instead of, you know, um, American history or, you know, <laughs> that, that's just small subsect of more of American history. Go check out Reason Revolution episode 36 because Justin makes a fantastic podcast over there and, you know, definitely has my stamp of approval. So, uh, I want to thank Justin for allowing me to come onto his show and for coming onto this show. Also, I want to let everybody know I was also on a recent episode of We Talk About Dead People podcast. And that is, um, it's just special episode and it's after episode 28, in between episode 28 and 29. They had me on to talk about Sidney Rigdon after a bit of a Twitter exchange between the gentleman at We Talk About Dead People and yours truly. And it was really fun to talk to them about Sidney Rigdon. Any chance I get an opportunity to talk about the hinge pin of Mormon history, I'm always super excited to do it. So if you want to uh, punch We Talk About Dead People and Reason Revolution into your favorite podcasting app of choice, or you you can chase the show notes of this episode and you can find links to both of those episodes. One final announcement before closing it down for the evening. We will be doing our Name of Home evening as we do with the first Monday of every month or try to do anyway. And that is actually going to be with featured guest Sam Young of the Protect LDS Children campaign. Now, just a little quick back history. If you haven't heard the news, what's going around or if you're listening to this in the backlog, Sam Young has uh, created this petition back in October of 2017 to uh, change the church's policy on how they conduct bishops interviews, particularly with relation to sexually explicit questioning. So Sam Sam has been nice enough to devote an hour and a half of his time to us on Monday evening. That is beginning at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, once again, March 5th, 2018. Patrons of the show, you can look for a link to join the Hangout when it uh, when we go live at 6 p.m. that evening. And you can uh, join in and ask any questions that you may have of Sam, um, you know, face to face in this Google Hangout, or you can listen to it after it airs. Now, I'm, I'm trying to uh, work out exactly how this is going to work. Obviously, we haven't done it at the time that I'm recording this. I have a feeling like there may be a fair amount of extremely pertinent information that comes out in that conversation that I may air on the regular feed. But podcast uh, listeners who are supporters at patreon.com slash naked Mormonism, you're not only going to get access to the, the Google Hangout when we actually conduct it, but you'll also get access to it when it airs on the Patreon exclusive feed for patrons only. So just be keeping an eye out for that. And if you want to join in the conversation with Sam Young, an ex-bishop and a current active believing member of the church who is working to change the church's policies from the inside, it looks like it's going to be a very interesting and useful conversation. I'm really looking forward to it. We have a couple of new patrons to thank. It looks like we have quasi Alamode. You know, it's not as good as the uh, the legitimate Alamo, it's a quasi Alamo, um, and Jeff, as well as Scott. So to our three new patrons, thank you so much for supporting, and we hope you enjoy the extra content that you get on the Patreon exclusive feed. With that, let's shut it down for the evening. Thank you so much to Julie for running the Twitter and Facebook pages. She keeps the conversation rolling over there. Be sure to follow us along on Twitter and Facebook at Naked Mormonism and give her a follow. She's at the real Emma Hale. Thank you so much to Natalie Newell for being the production assistant on the back end and connecting me up with all of these fantastic interviews. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you to Jason Camo. He provided the music that's used in the show with his permission. You can find more of his music at a lossstateofmind.com. Thank you to Andrew Torres of the Opening Arguments podcast and the law offices of P.A. Torres for providing legal counsel with this show. It keeps us all on the up and up. Thank you so much once again to all the patrons out there. And most importantly, thank you to those marvelously wonderful listeners out there once again for lending me your ear. Hope to talk to you next time here on the Naked Mormonism Podcast.
preceding podcast is a production of Ground Knowledge LLC, copyright 2018, all rights reserved.